Section 127 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1 by Isaac Disraeli. A Glance into the French Academy in the republic of letters the establishment of an academy has been a favourite project yet perhaps it is little more than an utopian scheme the united efforts of men of letters in academies have produced little it would seem that no man likes to bestow his great labours on a small community for whose members he himself does not feel probably the most flattering partiality the french academy made a splendid appearance in europe yet when this society published their dictionary that of furetiers became a formidable rival and johnson did as much as the forty themselves voltaire confesses that the great characters of the literary republic were formed without the aid of academies for what then he asks are they necessary to preserve and nourish the fire which great geniuses have kindled by observing the junto at their meetings we may form some opinion of the indolent manner in which they trifled away their time we are fortunately enabled to do this by a letter in which patru describes in a very amusing manner the visit which christina of sweden took a sudden fancy to pay to the academy the queen of sweden suddenly resolved to visit the french academy and gave so short a notice of her design that it was impossible to inform the majority of the members of her intention about four o'clock fifteen or sixteen academicians were assembled m gombault who had never forgiven her majesty because she did not relish his verses thought proper to show his resentment by quitting the assembly she was received in a spacious hall in the middle was a table covered with rich blue velvet ornamented with a broad border of gold and silver at its head was placed an armchair of black velvet embroidered with gold and round the table were placed chairs with tapestry backs the chancellor had forgotten to hang in the hall the portrait of the queen which she had presented to the academy and which was considered as a great omission about five a footman belonging to the queen inquired if the company were assembled soon after a servant of the king informed the chancellor that the queen was at the end of the street and immediately her carriage drew up in the courtyard the chancellor followed by the rest of the members went to receive her as she stepped out of her chariot but the crowd was so great that few of them could reach her majesty accompanied by the chancellor she passed through the first hall followed by one of her ladies the captain of her guards and one or two of her suite when she entered the academy she approached the fire and spoke in a low voice to the chancellor she then asked why m menage was not there and when she was told that he did not belong to the academy she asked why he did not she was answered that however he might merit the honour he had rendered himself unworthy of it by several disputes he had had with its members she then inquired aside of the chancellor whether the academicians were to sit or stand before her on this the chancellor consulted with a member who observed that in the time of ronsard there was held an assembly of men of letters before charles the ninth several times and that they were always seated the queen conversed with m bourdelot and suddenly turning to madame de brégy told her that she believed she must not be present at the assembly but it was agreed that this lady deserved the honour as the queen was talking with a member she abruptly quitted him as was her custom and in her quick way sat down in the armchair and at the same time the members seated themselves the queen observing that they did not out of respect to her approach the table desired them to come near and they accordingly approached it 
during these ceremonious preparations several officers of state had entered the hall and stood behind the academicians the chancellor sat at the queen's left hand by the fireside and at the right was placed m de la chambre the director then bois robert patru pelisson cotin the abbe talmont and others m de mezeray sat at the bottom of the table facing the queen with an inkstand paper and the portfolio of the company lying before him he occupied the place of the secretary when they were all seated the director rose and the academicians followed him all but the chancellor who remained in his seat the director made his complimentary address in a low voice his body was quite bent and no person but the queen and the chancellor could hear him she received his address with great satisfaction all compliments concluded they returned to their seats the director then told the queen that he had composed a treatise on pain to add to his character of the passions and if it was agreeable to her majesty he would read the first chapter very willingly she answered having read it he said to her majesty that he would read no more lest he should fatigue her not at all she replied for i suppose what follows is like what i have heard m de mezeray observed that m cotin had some verses which her majesty would doubtless find beautiful and if it was agreeable they should be read m cotin read them they were versions of two passages from lucretius the one in which he attacks a providence and the other where he gives the origin of the world according to the epicurean system to these he added twenty lines of his own in which he maintained the existence of a providence this done an abbe rose and without being desired or ordered read two sonnets which by courtesy were allowed to be tolerable it is remarkable that both the poets read their verses standing while the rest read their compositions seated after these readings the director informed the queen that the ordinary exercise of the company was to labour on the dictionary and that if her majesty should not find it disagreeable they would read a cahier very willingly she answered m de mazeray then read what related to the word jeu game amongst other proverbial expressions was this game of princes which only pleases the player to express a malicious violence committed by one in power at this the queen laughed heartily and they continued reading all that was fairly written this lasted about an hour when the queen observing that nothing more remained arose made a bow to the company and returned in the manner she entered Ferretier, who was himself an academician has described the miserable manner in which time was consumed at their assemblies i confess he was a satirist and had quarrelled with the academy there must have been notwithstanding sufficient resemblance for the following picture however it may be overcharged he has been blamed for thus exposing the eleusinian mysteries of literature to the uninitiated he who is most clamorous is he whom they suppose has most reason they all have the art of making long orations upon a trifle the second repeats like an echo what the first said but generally three or four speak together when there is a bench of five or six members one reads another decides to converse one sleeps and another amuses himself with reading some dictionary which happens to lie before him when a second member is to deliver his opinion they are obliged to read again the article which at the first perusal he had been too much engaged to hear this is a happy manner of finishing their work they can hardly get over two lines without long digressions without some one telling a pleasant story or the news of the day or talking of affairs of state and reforming the government that the french academy were generally frivolously employed appears also from an epistle to balzac by bois robert the amusing companion of cardinal richelieu every one separately says he promises great things when they meet they do nothing they have been six years employed on the letter f and i should be happy if i were certain of living till they got through g the following anecdote concerns the forty armchairs of the academicians footnote 
a very clever satire has been concocted in an imaginary history of a forty-first chair of the academy which has been occupied by the great men of literature who have not been recognized members of the official body and whose existence there has been unaccountably forgotten in the annals of its members End of footnote those cardinals who were academicians for a long time had not attended the meetings of the academy because they thought that armchairs were indispensable to their dignity and the academy had then only common chairs these cardinals were desirous of being present at the election of m manois that they might give him a distinguished mark of their esteem the king says d'alembert to satisfy at once the delicacy of their friendship and that of their cardinalship and to preserve at the same time that academical equality of which this enlightened monarch louis the fourteenth well knew the advantage sent to the academy forty armchairs for the forty academicians the same chairs which we now occupy and the motive to which we owe them is sufficient to render the memory of louis the fourteenth precious to the republic of letters to whom it owes so many more important obligations End of section one hundred and twenty seven Chapter 128 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. By Isaac Disraeli. Chapter 128. Poetical and Grammatical Deaths it will appear by the following anecdotes that some men may be said to have died poetically and even grammatically there must be some attraction existing in poetry which is not merely fictitious for often have its genuine votaries felt all its powers on the most trying occasions they have displayed the energy of their mind by composing or repeating verses even with death on their lips the emperor adrian dying made that celebrated address to his soul which is so happily translated by pope lucan when he had his veins opened by order of nero expired reciting a passage from his pharsalia in which he had described the wound of a dying soldier petronius did the same thing on the same occasion patrice a poet of caen perceiving himself expiring composed some verses which are justly admired in this little poem he relates a dream in which he appeared to be placed next to a beggar when having addressed him in the haughty strain he would probably have employed on this side of the grave he receives the following reprimand ici tous sont égaux je ne te dois plus rien je suis sur mon fumier comme toi sur le tien here all are equal now thy lot is mine i on my dunghill as thou art on thine des barreaux it is said wrote on his deathbed that well-known sonnet which is translated in the spectator margaret of austria when she was nearly perishing in a storm at sea composed her epitaph in verse had she perished what would have become of the epitaph and if she escaped of what use was it she should rather have said her prayers the verses however have all the naivete of the times they are si j margot la jante demoiselle que de marie et si mourut pucelle beneath this tomb is high-born margaret laid who had two husbands and yet died a maid she was betrothed to charles the eighth of france who forsook her and being next intended for the spanish infant in her voyage to spain she wrote these lines in a storm mademoiselle de sermont was surnamed the philosopher she was celebrated for her knowledge and taste in polite literature she died of a cancer in her breast and suffered her misfortune with exemplary patience she expired in finishing these verses which she addressed to death nectare clausa suo dignum tantorum pretium tulit illa laborum it was after cervantes had received extreme unction that he wrote the dedication of his persiles roscommon at the moment he expired with an energy of voice that expressed the most fervent devotion uttered two lines of his own version of dies irae waller in his last moments repeated some lines from virgil 
and Chaucer seems to have taken his farewell of all human vanities by a moral ode entitled A Ballade Made by Geoffrey Chaucer Upon His Death Bed Lying in His Greater Anguisse. Footnote 116. Barham, the author of the Inglesby Legends, wrote a similar deathbed lay in imitation of the older poets. It is termed As I Lay a Thinking. Bevick, the wood engraver, was last employed upon and left unfinished at his death a cut the subject of which was the old horse waiting for death and a footnote cornelius de witt fell an innocent victim to popular prejudice his death is thus noticed by hume this man who had bravely served his country in war and who had been invested with the highest dignities was delivered into the hands of the executioner and torn in pieces by the most inhuman torments Amidst the severe agonies which he endured, he frequently repeated an ode of Horace, which contained sentiments suited to his deplorable condition. It was the third ode of the third book which this illustrious philosopher and statesman then repeated. Metastasio, after receiving the sacrament, a very short time before his last moments, broke out with all the enthusiasm of poetry and religion in these stanzas. Tofro il tuo proprio filio che già d'amore in pegno racchiuso in picciol segno si vole a noi donar a lui rivolgi il cilio guardo chi t'offro e poi lasci signor se vuoi lascia di perdonar i offer to thee o lord thine own son who already has given the pledge of love enclosed in this thin emblem turn on him thine eyes ah behold whom i offer to thee and then desist, O Lord, if thou canst desist from mercy. The muse that has attended my course, says the dying Glime in a letter to Klopstock, still hovers round my steps to the very verge of the grave. A collection of lyrical poems, entitled Last Hours, composed by old Glime on his deathbed, was intended to be published. The death of Klopstock was one of the most poetical. In his poet's Messiah, he had made the death of Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, a picture of the death of the just, and on his own deathbed he was heard repeating, with an expiring voice, his own verses on Mary. He was exhorting himself to die by the accents of his own harp, the sublimities of his own muse. The same song of Mary was read at the public funeral of Klopstock. Chatelard, a French gentleman, beheaded in Scotland for having loved the Queen, and even for having attempted her honour, Brantome says, would not have any other viaticum than a poem of Ronsard. When he ascended the scaffold, he took the hymns of this poet, and for his consolation read Dead on Death, which our old critic says is well adapted to conquer its fear. When the Marquis of Montrose was condemned by his judges to have his limbs nailed to the gates of four cities, the brave soldier said that, he was sorry he had not limbs sufficient to be nailed to all the gates of the cities in Europe, as monuments of his loyalty. As he proceeded to his execution, he put this thought into verse. Philip Strozzi, imprisoned by Cosmo I, great duke of Tuscany, was apprehensive of the danger to which he might expose his friends, who had joined in his conspiracy against the duke, from the confessions which the wreck might extort from him. Having attempted every exertion for the liberty of his country, he considered it as no crime, therefore, to die. He resolved on suicide. With the point of the sword with which he killed himself, he cut out on the mantelpiece of the chimney this verse of Virgil. Exoriare aliquis nostris ex ossibus ultor. Rise some avenger from our blood. I can never repeat without a strong emotion the following stanzas, begun by André Chenier in the dreadful period of the French Revolution. He was waiting for his turn to be dragged to the guillotine when he commenced this poem. Comme un dernier rayon, comme un dernier zéphyr, anime la fin d'un beau jour, au pied de l'échafaud j'essaie encore ma lire. Peut-être est-ce bientôt mon tour. Peut-être avant que l'heure en cercle promené est posée sur les mailles brillants, dans les soixante pas où sa route est bornée, Son pied sonore et vigilant. Le sommeil du tombeau pressera ma paupière. Here, at this pathetic line, was André Chenier summoned to the guillotine. Never was a more beautiful effusion of grief interrupted by a more affecting incident. 
Several men of science have died in a scientific manner. Haller, the poet, philosopher, and physician, beheld his end approach with the utmost composure. He kept feeling his pulse to the last moment, and when he found that life was almost gone, he turned to his brother physician, observing, My friend, the artery ceases to beat, and almost instantly expired. The same remarkable circumstance had occurred to the great Harvey. He kept making observations on the state of his pulse when life was drawing to its close, as if, says Dr. Wilson in the oration spoken a few days after the event, that he who had taught us the beginning of life might himself, at his departing from it, become acquainted with those of death. Delany, who was intended by his friends for the study of the law, having fallen on an Euclid, found it so congenial to his dispositions that he devoted himself to mathematics. In his last moments, when he retained no further recollection of the friends who surrounded his bed, one of them, perhaps to make a philosophical experiment, thought proper to ask him the square of twelve. Our dying mathematician instantly, and perhaps without knowing that he answered, replied, 144. The following anecdotes are of a different complexion, and may excite a smile. Père Bohour was a French grammarian, who had been justly accused of paying too scrupulous an attention to the minutiae of letters. He was more solicitous of his words than his thoughts. It is said that when he was dying, he called out to his friends, a correct grammarian to the last, Je va ou je vais mourir, l'un ou l'autre se dit. When Malherbe was dying, he reprimanded his nurse for making use of a solecism in her language, and when his confessor represented to him the felicities of a future state in low and tried expressions, the dying critic interrupted him. Hold your tongue, he said. Your wretched style only makes me out of conceit with them. The favorite studies and amusements of the learned La Motte Le Vallée consisted in accounts of the most distant countries. He gave a striking proof of the influence of this master passion when death hung upon his lips. Bernier, the celebrated traveller, entering and drawing the curtains of his bed to take his eternal farewell, the dying man turning to him, with a faint voice inquired, Well, my friend, what news from the great Mogul? End of chapter 128「Section 129 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. Scarron. Scarron, as a burlesque poet, but no other comparison exists, had his merit, but is now little read, for the uniformity of the burlesque style is as intolerable as the uniformity of the serious. From various sources we may collect some uncommon anecdotes, although he was a mere author. His father, a counsellor, having married a second wife, the lively Scarron became the object of her hatred. He studied and travelled, and took the clerical tonsure, but discovered dispositions more suitable to the pleasures of his age than to the gravity of his profession. He formed an acquaintance with the wits of the times, and in the carnival of 1638 committed a youthful extravagance, for which his remaining days formed a continual punishment. He disguised himself as a savage, the singularity of a naked man attracted crowds. After having been hunted by the mob, he was forced to escape from his pursuers, and concealed himself in a marsh. A freezing cold seized him, and threw him, at the age of twenty-seven years, into a kind of palsy, a cruel disorder which tormented him all his life. It was thus, he says, that pleasure deprived me suddenly of legs which had danced with elegance, and of hands which could manage the pencil and the lute. Gouget, without stating this anecdote, describes his disorder as an acrid humour, distilling itself on his nerves and baffling the skill of his physicians. The sciatica, rheumatism in a word, a complication of maladies attacked him, sometimes successively, sometimes together, and made of our poor abbé a sad spectacle. He thus describes himself in one of his letters, and who could be in better humour? I have lived to thirty. If I reach forty, I shall only add many miseries to those which I have endured these last eight or nine years. My person was well made, though short. 
my disorder has shortened it still more by a foot my head is a little broad for my shape my face is full enough for my body to appear very meagre i have hair enough to render a wig unnecessary i have got many white hairs in spite of the proverb my teeth formerly square pearls are now of the colour of wood and will soon be of slate my legs and thighs first formed an obtuse angle afterwards an equilateral angle and at length an acute one my thighs and body form another and my head always dropping on my breast makes me not ill represent a z i have got my arms shortened as well as my legs and my fingers as well as my arms in a word i am an abridgment of human miseries he had the free use of nothing but his tongue and his hands and he wrote on a portfolio placed on his knees balzac said of scarron that he had gone further in insensibility than the stoics who were satisfied in appearing insensible to pain but scarron was gay and amused all the world with his sufferings he portrays himself thus humorously in his address to the queen je ne regarde plus qu'en bas je suis torticolis j'ai la tête penchante ma mine devient si plaisante que quand on en rit roi je ne m'en plaindrai pas i can only see under me i am wry necked my head hangs down my appearance is so droll that if people laugh i shall not complain he says elsewhere parmi les torticolis je passe pour un des plus jolis among your wry necked people i pass for one of the handsomest after having suffered this distortion of shape and these acute pains for four years he quitted his usual residence the quarter du marais for the baths of the faubourg saint germain he took leave of his friends by addressing some verses to them entitled adieu au marais in which he describes several celebrated persons when he was brought into the street in a chair the pleasure of seeing himself there once more overcame the pains which the motion occasioned and he has celebrated the transport by an ode which has for title the way from le marais to the faubourg saint germain the bath he tried had no effect on his miserable disorder but a new affliction was added to the catalogue of his griefs his father who had hitherto contributed to his necessities having joined the party against cardinal richelieu was exiled this affair was rendered still more unfortunate by his mother-in-law with her children at paris in the absence of her husband appropriating the property of the family to her own use hitherto scarron had had no connection with cardinal richelieu the conduct of his father had even rendered his name disagreeable to the minister who was by no means prone to forgiveness scarron however when he thought his passion moderated ventured to present a petition which is considered by the critics as one of his happiest productions richelieu permitted it to be read to him and acknowledged that it afforded him much pleasure and that it was pleasantly dated this pleasant date is thus given by scarron fait à paris dernier jour d'octobre par moi scarron qui malgré moi suis sobre l'an que l'on prit le fameux perpignan et sans canon la ville de sedan at paris done the last day of october by me scarron who wanting wine am sober the year they took famed perpignan and without cannonball sedan this was flattering the minister adroitly in two points very agreeable to him the poet augured well of the dispositions of the cardinal and lost no time to return to the charge by addressing an ode to him to which he gave the title of thanks as if he had already received the favours which he hoped he should receive thus ronsard dedicated to catherine of medicis who was prodigal of promises his hymn to promise but all was lost for scarron by the death of the cardinal when scarron's father died he brought his mother-in-law into court and to complete his misfortunes lost his suit the cases which he drew up for the occasion were so extremely burlesque that the world could not easily conceive how a man could amuse himself so pleasantly on a subject on which his existence depended the successor of richelieu the cardinal mazarin was insensible to his applications he did nothing for him although the poet dedicated to him his Tiffon, a burlesque poem in which the author describes the wars of the giants with the gods our bard was so irritated at this neglect that he suppressed a sonnet he had written in his favour and aimed at him several satirical bullets 
Scarron, however, consoled himself for this kind of disgrace with those select friends who were not inconstant in their visit to him. The Bishop of Mons also, solicited by a friend, gave him a living in his diocese. When Scarron had taken possession of it, he began his Roman Comique, ill translated into English by Comical Romance. He made friends by his dedications. Such resources were indeed necessary, for he not only lived well, but he had made his house an asylum for his two sisters, who there found refuge from an unfeeling stepmother. It was about this time that the beautiful and accomplished Mademoiselle d'Aubigny, afterwards so well known by the name of Madame de Maintenon, she who was to be one day the mistress, if not the queen of France, formed with Scarron the most romantic connection. She united herself in marriage with one whom she well knew could only be a lover. It was indeed amidst that literary society she formed her taste and embellished with her presence his little residence, where assembled the most polished courtiers and some of the finest geniuses of Paris of that famous party, called La Fronde, formed against Mazarin. Such was the influence this marriage had over Scarron, that after this period his writings became more correct and more agreeable than those which he had previously composed. Scarron, on his side, gave a proof of his attachment to Madame de Maintenon, for by marrying her he lost his living of Mons. But though without wealth, he was accustomed to say that his wife and he would not live uncomfortable by the produce of his estate and the Marquisat of Guinée. Thus he called the revenue which his compositions produced, and Guinée was his bookseller. Scarron addressed one of his dedications to his dog, to ridicule those writers who dedicate their works indiscriminately, though no author has been more liberal of dedications than himself. But as he confessed, he made dedication a kind of business. When he was low in cash, he always dedicated to some lord whom he praised as warmly as his dog, but whom probably he did not esteem as much. When Scarron was visited, previous to general conversation, his friends were taxed with a perusal of what he had written since he saw them last. Segre and a friend calling on him, "'Take a chair,' said our author, "'and let me try on you my roman comique.' He took his manuscript, read several pages, and when he observed that they laughed, he said, "'Good, this goes well. My book can't fail of success, since it obliges such able persons as yourselves to laugh,' and then remained silent to receive their compliments. He used to call this trying on his romance, as a tailor tries his coat." He was agreeable and diverting in all things, even in his complaints and passions. Whatever he conceived, he immediately too freely expressed, but his amiable lady corrected him of this in three months after marriage. He petitioned the queen, in his droll manner, to be permitted the honour of being her sick man by right of office. These verses form a part of his address to her majesty. Scarron, par la grâce de Dieu, malade and digne de la reine, Homme n'ayant ni feu ni lieu, mais bien du mal et de la peine. Hôpital allant et venant, des jambes d'autrui cheminant, des cieux n'ayant plus l'usage, souffrant beaucoup, dormant bien peu, et pourtant faisant par courage, bonne mine et fort mauvais jeu. Scarron, by the grace of God, the unworthy sick man of the Queen, a man without a house, though a moving hospital of disorders, walking only with other people's legs, with great sufferings but little sleep, and yet in spite of all, very courageously showing a hearty countenance, though indeed he plays a losing game. She smiled, granted the title, and, what was better, added a small pension, which, losing, by lampooning the minister Mazarin, Fouquet generously granted him a more considerable one. The termination of the miseries of this facetious genius was now approaching. To one of his friends, who was taking leave of him for some time, Scarron said, I shall soon die. The only regret I have in dying is not to be enabled to leave some property to my wife, who is possessed of infinite merit, and whom I have every reason imaginable to admire and to praise. One day he was seized with so violent a fit of the hiccup that his friends now considered his prediction would soon be verified. When it was over, If ever I recover, cried Scarron, I will write a bitter satire against the hiccup. The satire, however, was never written, for he died soon after. A little before his death, when he observed his relations and domestics weeping and groaning, he was not much affected, but humorously told them, 
My children, you will never weep for me so much as I have made you laugh. A few moments before he died, he said that he never thought that it was so easy a matter to laugh at the approach of death. The burlesque compositions of Scarron are now neglected by the French. This species of writing was much in vogue till attacked by the critical Boileau, who annihilated such puny writers as Dassouci and Dulot with their stupid admirers. It is said he spared Scarron because his merit, though it appeared but at intervals, was uncommon. Yet so much were burlesque verses the fashion after Scarron's works, that the booksellers would not publish poems, but with the word burlesque in the title page. In 1649 appeared a poem which shocked the pious entitled The Passion of Our Lord in Burlesque Verses. Swift, in his dotage, appears to have been gratified by such puerilities as Scarron frequently wrote. An ode which Swift calls a Lilliputian ode, consisting of verses of three syllables, probably originated in a long epistle in verses of three syllables, which Scarron addressed to Sarrazin. It is pleasant, and the following lines will serve as a specimen. Epitre à Monsieur Sarrazin Sarrazin, mon voisin, cher ami, qu'à demi, je ne vois, dans ma foi, j'ai des pis, un petit. N'es-tu pas Barabas, Busiris, Phalaris, Ganelon, Le Felon? He describes himself. Un pauvre, très maigre, au col tort, dans le corps, tout tortu, tout bossu, suranné, décharné et réduit, jour et nuit, à souffrir, sans guérir, des tourments véhéments. He complains of Sarrazin's not visiting him, threatens to reduce him into powder if he comes not quickly, and concludes. Mais pourtant, repentant, si tu viens, et tu tiens, settlement, un moment, avec nous, mon courroux finira, etc. The roman comique of our author abounds with pleasantry, with wit and character. His Virgile Travesti it is impossible to read long, this we likewise feel in Cotton's Virgil Travestied, which has notwithstanding considerable merit. Buffoonery after a certain time exhausts our patience. It is the chaste actor only who can keep the attention awake for a length of time. It is said that Scarron intended to write a tragedy. This perhaps would not have been the least facetious of his burlesques. End of section 129section 130 of curiosities of literature volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sonia curiosities of literature volume 1 by isaac disraeli peter corney exact racine and corney's noble fire showed us that france had something to admire pope the great corneille having finished his studies devoted himself to the bar but this was not the stage on which his abilities were to be displayed he followed the occupation of a lawyer for some time without taste and without success a trifling circumstance discovered to the world and to himself a different genius a young man who was in love with a girl of the same town having solicited him to be his companion in one of those secret visits which he paid to the lady it happened that the stranger pleased infinitely more than his introducer the pleasure arising from this adventure excited in corneille a talent which had hitherto been unknown to him and he attempted as if it were by inspiration dramatic poetry on this little subject he wrote his comedy of milite in sixteen twenty five at that moment the french drama was at a low ebb the most favourable ideas were formed of our juvenile poet and comedy it was expected would now reach its perfection after the tumult of approbation had ceased the critics thought that melite was too simple and barren of incident roused by this criticism our poet wrote his clitendre and in that piece has scattered incidents and adventures with such a licentious profusion that the critics say he wrote it rather to expose the public taste than to accommodate himself to it. In this piece the persons combat on the theatre, there are murders and assassinations, heroines fight, officers appear in search of murderers, and women are disguised as men. 
there is matter sufficient for a romance of ten volumes. And yet, says a French critic, nothing can be more cold and tiresome. He afterwards indulged his natural genius in various other performances, but began to display more forcibly his tragic powers in Medea. A comedy which he afterwards wrote was a very indifferent composition. He regained his full lustre in the famous Cid, a tragedy of which he preserved in his closet translations in all the European languages, except the Sclavonian and the Turkish. He pursued his poetical career with uncommon splendour in the Horaces, Cinna, and at length in Polyucte, which productions, the French critics say, can never be surpassed. At length, the tragedy of Pertarit appeared, and proved unsuccessful. This so much disgusted our veteran Bart, that, like Ben Jonson, he could not conceal his chagrin in the preface. There the poet tells us that he renounces the theatre forever. And indeed, this eternity lasted for several years. Disgusted by the fate of his unfortunate tragedy, he directed his poetical pursuits to a different species of composition. He now finished his translation in verse of The Imitation of Jesus Christ by Thomas a Kempis. This work, perhaps from the singularity of its dramatic author becoming a religious writer, was attended with astonishing success. Yet Fontenelle did not find in this translation the prevailing charm of the original, which consists in that simplicity and naivete which are lost in the pomp of versification so natural to Corneille. This book, he continues, the finest that ever proceeded from the hand of man, since the gospel does not come from man, would not go so direct to the heart, and would not seize on it with such force if it had not a natural and tender air, to which even that negligence which prevails in the style greatly contributes. Voltaire appears to confirm the opinion of our critic in respect to the translation. It is reported that Corneille's translation of The Imitation of Jesus Christ has been printed thirty-two times. It is as difficult to believe this as it is to read the book once. Corneille seems not to have been ignorant of the truth of this criticism. In his dedication to the Pope, he says, The translation which I have chosen, by the simplicity of its style, precludes all the rich ornaments of poetry, and far from increasing my reputation, must be considered rather as a sacrifice made to the glory of the sovereign author of all, which I may have acquired by my poetical productions. This is an excellent elucidation of the truth of that precept of Johnson, which respects religious poetry, but of which the author of Calvary seemed not to have been sensible. The merit of religious compositions appears, like this imitation of Jesus Christ, to consist in a simplicity inimical to the higher poetical embellishments. These are too human. When Racine the Sun published a long poem on grace, taken in its holy sense a most unhappy subject at least for poetry, it was said that he had written on grace without grace. During the space of six years, Corneille rigorously kept his promise of not writing for the theatre. At length, overpowered by the persuasions of his friends, and probably by his own inclinations, he once more directed his studies to the drama. He recommenced in 1659, and finished in 1675. During this time he wrote ten new pieces, and published a variety of little religious poems, which, although they do not attract the attention of posterity, were then read with delight, and probably preferred to the finest tragedies by the good Catholics of the day. In 1675 he terminated his career. In the last year of his life his mind became so enfeebled as to be incapable of thinking, and he died in extreme poverty. It is true that his uncommon genius had been amply rewarded, but amongst his talents that of preserving the favours of fortune he had not acquired. Fontenelle, his nephew, presents a minute and interesting description of this great man. Vigneul Marville says that when he saw Corneille he had the appearance of a country tradesman, and he could not conceive how a man of so rustic an appearance could put into the mouth of his Romans such heroic sentiments. Corneille was sufficiently large and full in his person, his air simple and vulgar, always negligent, and very little solicitous of pleasing by his exterior. His face had something agreeable, his nose large, his mouth not unhandsome, his eyes full of fire, his physiognomy lively with strong features, 
well adapted to be transmitted to posterity on a medal or bust his pronunciation was not very distinct and he read his verses with force but without grace he was acquainted with polite literature with history and politics but he generally knew them best as they related to the stage for other knowledge he had neither leisure curiosity nor much esteem he spoke little even on subjects which he perfectly understood he did not embellish what he said and to discover the great corneille it became necessary to read him he was of a melancholy disposition had something blunt in his manner and sometimes he appeared rude but in fact he was no disagreeable companion and made a good father and husband he was tender and his soul was very susceptible of friendship his constitution was very favourable to love but never to debauchery and rarely to violent attachment his soul was fierce and independent it could never be managed for it would never bend this indeed rendered him very capable of portraying roman virtue but incapable of improving his fortune nothing equalled his incapacity for business but his aversion the slightest troubles of this kind occasioned him alarm and terror he was never satiated with praise although he was continually receiving it but if he was sensible to fame he was far removed from vanity what fontenelle observes of corneille's love of fame is strongly proved by our great poet himself in an epistle to a friend in which we find the following remarkable description of himself an instance that what the world calls vanity at least interests in a great genius nous nous aimons un peu c'est notre faible à tout le prix que nous valons que le sait mieux que nous et puis la mode en est et la cour l'autorise nous parlons de nous-mêmes avec toute franchise la fausse humilité ne met plus en crédit je sais ce que je vaux et crois ce qu'on m'en dit pour me faire admirer je ne fais point de ligue j'ai peu de voix pour moi mais je les ai sans brigue et mon ambition pour faire plus de bruit ne les va point quêter de réduit en réduit mon travail sans appui monte sur le théâtre chacun en liberté lit blâme ou idolâtre là sans que mes amis prêchent leurs sentiments j'arrache quelquefois leurs applaudissements là content du succès que le mérite donne par d'illustres avis je n'éblouis personne je satisfais ensemble et peuple et courtisans et mes vers en tout lieu sont mes seuls partisans par leur seule beauté ma plume est estimée je ne dois qu'à moi seul toute ma renommée et pense toutefois n'avoir point de rival à qui je fasse tort en le traitant d'égal i give his sentiments in english verse self-love prevails too much in every state who like ourselves our secret worth can rate since this a fashion authorized at court frankly our merits we ourselves report a proud humility will not deceive i know my worth what others say believe to be admired i form no petty league few are my friends but gained without intrigue my bold ambition destitute of grace scorns still to beg their votes from place to place on the fair stage my scenic toils i raise while each is free to censure or to praise and there unaided by inferior arts i snatch the applause that rushes from their hearts content by merit still to win the crown with no illustrious names i cheat the town the galleries thunder and the pit commends my verses everywhere my only friends tis from their charms alone my praise i claim tis to myself alone i owe my fame and know no rival whom i fear to meet or injure when i grant an equal seat voltaire censures corneille for making his heroes say continually they are great men but in drawing the character of a hero he draws his own all his heroes are only so many corneilles in different situations thomas corneille attempted the same career as his brother perhaps his name was unfortunate for it naturally excited a comparison which could not be favourable to him gasson the dennis of his day wrote the following smart impromptu under his portrait voyons le portrait de corneille gardez-vous de crier merveille et dans vos transports n'allez pas prendre ici pierre pour thomas End of section 130.
section one hundred and thirty one of curiosities of literature volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume one by isaac disraeli poets in all ages there has existed an anti-poetical party this faction consists of those frigid intellects incapable of that glowing expansion so necessary to feel the charms of an art which only addresses itself to the imagination or of writers who having proved unsuccessful in their court to the muses revenge themselves by reviling them and also of those religious minds who consider the ardent effusions of poetry as dangerous to the morals and peace of society plato amongst the ancients is the model of those moderns who profess themselves to be anti-poetical this writer in his ideal republic characterizes a man who occupies himself with composing verses as a very dangerous member of society from the inflammatory tendency of his writings it is by arguing from its abuse that he decries this enchanting talent at the same time it is to be recollected that no head was more finely organized for the visions of the muse than plato's he was a true poet and had addicted himself in his prime of life to the cultivation of the art but perceiving that he could not surpass his inimitable original homer he employed this insidious manner of depreciating his works in the phaedon he describes the feelings of a genuine poet to become such he says it will never be sufficient to be guided by the rules of art unless we also feel the ecstasies of that furor almost divine which in this kind of composition is the most palpable and least ambiguous character of a true inspiration cold minds ever tranquil and ever in possession of themselves are incapable of producing exalted poetry their verses must always be feeble diffusive and leave no impression the verses of those who are endowed with a strong and lively imagination and who like homer's personification of discord have their heads incessantly in the skies and their feet on the earth will agitate you burn in your heart and drag you along with them breaking like an impetuous torrent and swelling your breast with that enthusiasm with which they are themselves possessed such is the character of a poet in a poetical age the tuneful race have many corporate bodies of mechanics pontypool manufacturers inlayers burnishers gilders and filers men of taste are sometimes disgusted in turning over the works of the anti-poetical by meeting with gross railleries and false judgments concerning poetry and poets locke has expressed a marked contempt of poets but we see what ideas he formed of poetry by his warm panegyric of one of blackmore's epics and besides he was himself a most unhappy poet selden a scholar of profound erudition has given us his opinion concerning poets it is ridiculous for a lord to print verses he may make them to please himself if a man in a private chamber twirls his band-strings or plays with a rush to please himself it is well enough but if he should go into fleet street and sit upon a stall and twirl a band-string or play with a rush then all the boys in the street would laugh at him as if the sublime and the beautiful can endure a comparison with the twirling of a band-string or playing with a rush a poet related to an illustrious family and who did not write unpoetically entertained a far different notion concerning poets so persuaded was he that to be a true poet required an elevated mind that it was a maxim with him that no writer could be an excellent poet who was not descended from a noble family 
this opinion is as absurd as that of selden but when one party will not grant enough the other always assumes too much the great pascal whose extraordinary genius was discovered in the sciences knew little of the nature of poetical beauty he said poetry has no settled object this was the decision of a geometrician not of a poet why should he speak of what he did not understand asked the lively voltaire poetry is not an object which comes under the cognizance of philosophy or wit longrue had profound erudition but he decided on poetry in the same manner as those learned men nothing so strongly characterizes such literary men as the following observations in the longruana page one seventy there are two books on homer which i prefer to homer himself the first is antiquitates homerisci of phytheus where he has extracted everything relative to the usages and customs of the greeks the other is homeri nomologia per duportum printed at cambridge in these two books is found everything valuable in homer without being obliged to get through his cant a domir debout thus men of science decide on men of taste there are who study homer and virgil as the blind travel through a fine country merely to get to the end of their journey it was observed at the death of longrue that in his immense library not a volume of poetry was to be found he had formerly read poetry for indeed he had read everything racine tells us that when young he paid him a visit the conversation turned on poets our erudits reviewed them all with the most ineffable contempt of the poetical talent from which he said we learn nothing he seemed a little charitable towards ariosto as for that madman said he he has amused me sometimes dacier a poetical pedant after all was asked who was the greater poet homer or virgil he honestly answered homer by a thousand years but it is mortifying to find among the anti-poetical even poets themselves malherbe the first poet in france in his day appears little to have esteemed the art he used to say that a good poet was not more useful to the state than a skilful player of nine-pins malherbe wrote with costive labour when a poem was shown to him which had been highly commended he sarcastically asked if it would lower the price of bread in these instances he maliciously confounded the useful with the agreeable arts be it remembered that malherbe had a cynical heart cold and unfeeling his character may be traced in his poetry labour and correctness without one ray of enthusiasm leclerc was a scholar not entirely unworthy to be ranked amongst the locks the seldens and the longrues and his opinions are as just concerning poets in the parhasiana he has written a treatise on poets in a very unpoetical manner i shall notice his coarse railleries relating to what he calls the personal defects of poets in volume one page thirty three he says in the scaligerana we have joseph scaliger's opinion concerning poets there never was a man who was a poet or addicted to the study of poetry but his heart was puffed up with his greatness this is very true the poetical enthusiasm persuades those gentlemen that they have something in them superior to others because they employ a language peculiar to themselves when the poetic furor seizes them its traces frequently remain on their faces which make connoisseurs say with horace out in sanit homo ant versus facit there goes a madman or a bard 
their thoughtful air and melancholy gait make them appear insane for accustomed to versify while they walk and to bite their nails in apparent agonies their steps are measured and slow and they look as if they were reflecting on something of consequence although they are only thinking as the phrase runs of nothing i have only transcribed the above description of our jocular scholar with an intention of describing those exterior marks of that fine enthusiasm of which the poet is peculiarly susceptible and which have exposed many an elevated genius to the ridicule of the vulgar i find this admirably defended by charpentier men may ridicule as much as they please those gesticulations and contortions which poets are apt to make in the act of composing it is certain however that they greatly assist in putting the imagination into motion these kinds of agitation do not always show a mind which labours with its sterility they frequently proceed from a mind which excites and animates itself quintilian has nobly compared them to those lashings of his tail which a lion gives himself when he is preparing to combat perseus when he would give us an idea of a cold and languishing oration says that its author did not strike his desk nor bite his nails nec plutium sidit nec demorsus sapit ungues these exterior marks of enthusiasm may be illustrated by the following curious anecdote domenichino the painter was accustomed to act the characters of all the figures he would represent on his canvas and to speak aloud whatever the passion he meant to describe could prompt painting the martyrdom of st andrew caracci one day caught him in a violent passion speaking in a terrible and menacing tone he was at that moment employed on a soldier who was threatening the saint when this fit of enthusiastic abstraction had passed caracci ran and embraced him acknowledging that domenichino had been that day his master and that he had learnt from him the true manner to succeed in catching the expression that great pride of the painter's art thus different are the sentiments of the intelligent and the unintelligent on the same subject a caracci embraced a kindred genius for what a leclerc or a selden would have ridiculed poets i confess frequently indulge reveries which though they offer no charms to their friends are too delicious to forego in the ideal world peopled with all its fairy inhabitants and ever open to their contemplation they travel with an unwearied foot Crebillon, the celebrated tragic poet was enamoured of solitude that he might there indulge without interruption in those fine romances with which his imagination teemed one day when he was in a deep reverie a friend entered hastily don't disturb me cried the poet i am enjoying a moment of happiness i am going to hang a villain of a minister and banish another who is an idiot amongst the anti-poetical may be placed the father of the great monarch of prussia george the second was not more the avowed enemy of the muses frederick would not suffer the prince to read verses and when he was desirous of study or of the conversation of literary men he was obliged to do it secretly every poet was odious to his majesty one day having observed some lines written on one of the doors of the palace he asked a courtier their signification they were explained to him they were latin verses composed by wachter a man of letters then resident at berlin the king immediately sent for the bard who came warm with the hope of receiving a reward for his ingenuity he was astonished however to hear the king in a violent passion accost him i order you immediately to quit this city and my kingdom wachter took refuge in hanover as little indeed was this anti-poetical monarch a friend to philosophers two or three such kings might perhaps renovate the ancient barbarism of europe baratier the celebrated child was presented to his majesty of prussia as a prodigy of erudition 
the king to mortify our ingenious youth coldly asked him if he knew the law the learned boy was constrained to acknowledge that he knew nothing of the law go was the reply of this augustus go and study it before you give yourself out as a scholar poor baratier renounced for this pursuit his other studies and persevered with such ardour that he became an excellent lawyer at the end of fifteen months but his exertions cost him at the same time his life every monarch however has not proved so destitute of poetic sensibility as this prussian francis i gave repeated marks of his attachment to the favourites of the muses by composing several occasional sonnets which are dedicated to their eulogy andrelin a french poet enjoyed the happy fate of opion to whom the emperor caracalla counted as many pieces of gold as there were verses in one of his poems and with great propriety they have been called golden verses andrelin when he recited his poem on the conquest of naples before charles the eighth received a sack of silver coin which with difficulty he carried home charles the ninth says brantome loved verses and recompensed poets not indeed immediately but gradually that they might always be stimulated to excel he used to say that poets resembled race-horses that must be fed but not fattened for then they were good for nothing moreau was so much esteemed by kings that he was called the poet of princes and the prince of poets in the early state of poetry what honours were paid to its votaries ronsard the french chaucer was the first who carried away the prize at the floral games this meed of poetic honour was an eglantine composed of silver the reward did not appear equal to the merit of the work and the reputation of the poet and on this occasion the city of toulouse had a minerva of solid silver struck of considerable value this image was sent to ronsard accompanied by a decree in which he was declared by way of eminence the french poet it is a curious anecdote to add that when at a later period a similar minerva was adjudged to maynard for his verses the capitouls of toulouse who were the executors of the floral gifts to their shame out of covetousness never obeyed the decision of the poetical judges this circumstance is noticed by maynard in an epigram which bears this title on a minerva of silver promised but not given the anecdote of margaret of scotland wife of the dauphin of france and alain the poet is generally known who is not charmed with that fine expression of her poetical sensibility the person of alain was repulsive but his poetry had attracted her affections passing through one of the halls of the palace she saw him sleeping on a bench she approached and kissed him some of her attendants could not conceal their astonishment that she should press with her lips those of a man so frightfully ugly the amiable princess answered smiling i did not kiss the man but the mouth which has uttered so many fine things the great colbert paid a pretty compliment to boileau and racine this minister at his villa was enjoying the conversation of our two poets when the arrival of a prelate was announced turning quickly to the servant he said let him be shown everything except myself to such attentions from this great minister boileau alludes in these verses plus d'un grand maman jusqu'à la tendresse et ma vue à colbert inspire la la grâce several pious persons have considered it as highly meritable to abstain from the reading of poetry a good father in his account of the last hours of madame racine the lady of the celebrated tragic poet pays high compliments to her religious disposition which he says was so austere that she would not allow herself to read poetry as she considered it to be a dangerous pleasure and he highly commends her for never having read the tragedies of her husband arnaud though so intimately connected with racine for many years had not read his compositions 
when at length he was persuaded to read phaedra he declared himself to be delighted but complained that the poet had set a dangerous example in making the manly hippolytus dwindle to an effeminate lover as a critic arnauld was right but racine had his nation to please such persons entertain notions of poetry similar to that of an ancient father who calls poetry the wine of satan or to that of the religious and austere nicole who was so ably answered by racine he said that dramatic poets were public poisoners not of bodies but of souls poets it is acknowledged have foibles peculiar to themselves they sometimes act in the daily commerce of life as if every one was concerned in the success of their productions poets are too frequently merely poets segray has recorded that the following maxim of rochefoucauld was occasioned by reflecting on the characters of Wallo and racine it displays he writes a great poverty of mind to have only one kind of genius on this segre observes and segre knew them intimately that their conversation only turned on poetry take them from that and they knew nothing it was thus with one du perrier a good poet but very poor when he was introduced to pelisson who wished to be serviceable to him the minister said in what can he be employed he is only occupied by his verses all these complaints are not unfounded yet perhaps it is unjust to expect from an excelling artist all the petty accomplishments of frivolous persons who have studied no art but that of practising on the weaknesses of their friends the enthusiastic votary who devotes his days and nights to meditations on his favourite art will rarely be found that despicable thing a mere man of the world du bose has justly observed that men of genius born for a particular profession appear inferior to others when they apply themselves to other occupations that absence of mind which arises from their continued attention to their ideas renders them awkward in their manners such defects are even a proof of the activity of genius it is a common foible with poets to read their verses to friends sucre has ingeniously observed to use his own words when young i used to please myself in reciting my verses indifferently to all persons but i perceived when scarron who was my intimate friend used to take his portfolio and read his verses to me although they were good i frequently became weary i then reflected that those to whom i read mine and who for the greater part had no taste for poetry must experience the same disagreeable sensation i resolved for the future to read my verses only to those who entreated me and to read but a few at a time we flatter ourselves too much we conclude that what please us must please others we will have persons indulgent to us and frequently we will have no indulgence for those who are in want of it an excellent hint for young poets and for those old ones who carry odes and elegies in their pockets to inflict the pains of the torture on their friends the affection which a poet feels for his verses has been frequently extravagant bayle ridiculing that parental tenderness which writers evince for their poetical compositions tells us that many having written epitaphs on friends whom they believed on report to have died could not determine to keep them in their closet but suffered them to appear in the lifetime of those very friends whose death they celebrated in another place he says such is their infatuation for their productions that they prefer giving to the public their panegyrics of persons whom afterwards they satirized rather than suppress the verses which contain those panegyrics we have many examples of this in the poems and even in the epistolary correspondence of modern writers it is customary with most authors when they quarrel with a person after the first edition of their work to cancel his eulogies in the next but poets and letter writers frequently do not do this because they are so charmed with the happy turn of their expressions and other elegancies of composition that they prefer the praise which they may acquire for their style to the censure which may follow from their inconsistency 
after having given a hint to young poets i shall offer one to veterans it is a common defect with them that they do not know when to quit the muses in their advanced age bayle says poets and orators should be mindful to retire from their occupations which so peculiarly require the fire of imagination yet it is but too common to see them in their career even in the decline of life it seems as if they would condemn the public to drink even the lees of their nectar affer and dura were both poets who had acquired considerable reputation but which they overturned when they persisted to write in their old age without vigour and without fancy what crowds of these impenitently bold in sounds and jingling syllables grown old they run on poets in a raging rain e'en to the dregs and squeezings of the brain strain out the last dull droppings of their sense and rhyme with all the rage of impotence pope it is probable he had witcherly in his eye when he wrote this the veteran bard latterly scribbled much in different verse and pope had freely given his opinion by which he lost his friendship it is still worse when aged poets devote their exhausted talents to divine poems as did waller and milton in his second epic such poems observes voltaire are frequently entitled sacred poems and sacred they are for no one touches them from a soil so arid what can be expected but insipid fruits corneille told chevreau several years before his death that he had taken leave of the theatre for he had lost his poetical powers with his teeth poets have sometimes displayed an obliquity of taste in their female favourites as if conscious of the power of ennobling others some have selected them from the lowest classes whom having elevated into divinities they have addressed in the language of poetical devotion the chloe of prior after all his raptures was a plump barmaid ronsard addressed many of his verses to miss cassandra who followed the same occupation in one of his sonnets to her he fills it with a crowd of personages taken from the iliad which to the honest girl must have all been extremely mysterious Colette, a french bard married three of his servants his last lady was called la belle claudine ashamed of such menial alliances he attempted to persuade the world that he had married the tenth muse and for this purpose published verses in her name when he died the vein of claudine became suddenly dry she indeed published her adieu to the muses but it was soon discovered that all the verses of this lady including her adieu were the compositions of her husband sometimes indeed the ostensible mistresses of poets have no existence and a slight occasion is sufficient to give birth to one racan and malherbe were one day conversing on their amour that is of selecting a lady who should be the object of their verses racan named one and malherbe another it happening that both had the same name catherine they passed the whole afternoon in forming it into an anagram they found three arthenice aracintha and carinthe the first was preferred and many a fine ode was written in praise of the beautiful arthenice poets changed their opinions of their own productions wonderfully at different periods of life baron holler was in his youth warmly attached to poetic composition his house was on fire and to rescue his poems he rushed through the flames he was so fortunate as to escape with his beloved manuscripts in his hand ten years afterwards he condemned to the flames those very poems which he had ventured his life to preserve satirists if they escape the scourges of the law have reason to dread the cane of the satirized of this kind we have many anecdotes on record but none more poignant than the following ben serad was caned for lampooning the duc de pernon some days afterwards he appeared at court but being still lame from the rough treatment he had received he was forced to support himself by a cane a wit who knew what had passed whispered the affair to the queen she dissembling asked him if he had the gout yes madam replied our lame satirist and therefore i make use of a cane not so interrupted the malignant beautru bonsorade in this imitates those holy martyrs who are always represented with the instrument which occasioned their sufferings 
End of section 131. Section 132 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1 by Isaac Disraeli. Romances Romance has been elegantly defined as the offspring of fiction and love. Men of learning have amused themselves with tracing the epoca of romances, but the erudition is desperate which would fix on the inventor of the first romance. For what originates in nature, who shall hope to detect the shadowy outlines of its beginnings? The Theagenes and Caraclea of Heliodorus appeared in the fourth century, and this elegant prelate was the Grecian Fenelon. It has been prettily said that posterior romances seem to be the children of the marriage of Theagenes and Caraclea. The Romance of the Golden Ass by Apuleius, which contains the beautiful tale of Cupid and Psyche, remains unrivaled, while the Daphne and Chloe of Longus in the old version of Amiot is inexpressibly delicate, simple, and inartificial, but sometimes offends us, for nature there plays her virgin fancies. Beautiful as these compositions are, when the imagination of the writer is sufficiently stored with accurate observations on human nature, in their birth, like many of the fine arts, the zealots of an ascetic religion opposed their progress. However, Heliodorus may have delighted those who were not insensible to the felicities of a fine imagination, and to the enchanting elegancies of style, he raised himself among his brother ecclesiastics enemies who at length so far prevailed that in a synod it was declared that his performance was dangerous to young persons and that if the author did not suppress it he must resign his bishopric we are told he preferred his romance to his bishopric even so late as in racine's time it was held a crime to peruse these unhallowed pages he informs us that the first effusions of his muse were in consequence of studying that ancient romance which his tutor observing him to devour with the keenness of a famished man snatched from his hands and flung it in the fire a second copy experienced the same fate what could racine do he bought a third and took the precaution of devouring it secretly till he got it by heart after which he offered it to the pedagogue with a smile to burn like the others the decision of these ascetic bigots was founded in their opinion of the immorality of such works they alleged that the writers paint too warmly to the imagination address themselves too forcibly to the passions and in general by the freedom of their representations hover on the borders of indecency let it be sufficient however to observe that those who condemned the liberties which these writers take with the imagination could indulge themselves with the anacreontic voluptuousness of the wise solomon when sanctioned by the authority of the church the marvellous power of romance over the human mind is exemplified in this curious anecdote of oriental literature mohammed found they had such an influence over the imaginations of his followers that he has expressly forbidden them in his koran and the reason is given in the following anecdote an arabian merchant having long resided in persia returned to his own country while the prophet was publishing his koran the merchant among his other riches had a treasure of romances concerning the persian heroes these he related to his delighted countrymen who considered them to be so excellent that the legends of the koran were neglected and they plainly told the prophet that the persian tales were superior to his alarmed he immediately had a visitation from the angel gabriel declaring them impious and pernicious hateful to god and mahomet this checked their currency and all true believers yielded up the exquisite delight of poetic fictions for the insipidity of religious ones 
yet these romances may be said to have outlived the koran itself for they have spread into regions which the koran could never penetrate even to this day colonel capper in his travels across the desert saw arabians sitting round a fire listening to their tales with such attention and pleasure as totally to forget the fatigue and hardship with which an instant before they were entirely overcome and would in his journey to palmyra at night the arab sat in a circle drinking coffee while one of the company diverted the rest by relating a piece of history on the subject of love or war or with an extempore tale mr ellis has given us specimens of the early english metrical romances and ritson and weber have printed two collections of them entire valued by the poetical antiquary learned inquirers have traced the origin of romantic fiction to various sources footnote since the above was written many other volumes have been published illustrative of this branch of literature the bannantyne and maitland club and the camden and percy societies have printed metrical romances entire End of footnote from scandinavia issued forth the giants dragons witches and enchanters the curious reader will be gratified by illustrations of northern antiquities a volume in quarto where he will find extracts from the book of heroes and the nibelungen lay footnote this famed lay has been magnificently published in germany where it is now considered as the native epic of the ancient kingdom its scenes have been delineated by the greatest of their artists who have thus given a world-wide reputation to a poem comparatively unknown when the first edition of this work was printed End of footnote. with many other metrical tales from the old german danish swedish and icelandic languages in the east arabian fancy bent her iris of many softened hues over a delightful land of fiction while the welsh in their emigration to brittany are believed to have brought with them their national fables that subsequent race of minstrels known by the name of troubadours in the south of france composed their erotic or sentimental poems and those romancers called trouveurs or finders in the north of france called and compiled their domestic tales or fabliaux dits contes or lay melot saint pelier and le grand have preserved in their histories of the troubadours their literary compositions they were a romantic race of ambulatory poets military and religious subjects their favourite themes yet bold and satirical on princes and even on priests severe moralizers though libertines in their verse so refined and chaste in their manners that few husbands were alarmed at the enthusiastic language they addressed to their wives the most romantic incidents are told of their loves but love and its grosser passion were clearly distinguished from each other in their singular intercourse with their dames the object of their mind was separated from the object of their senses the virtuous lady to whom they vowed their hearts was in their language styled la dame de ses pensées a very distinct being from their other mistress such was the platonic chimera that charmed in the age of chivalry the laura of petrarch might have been no other than the lady of his thoughts from such productions in their improved state poets of all nations have drawn their richest inventions the agreeable wildness of that fancy which characterized the eastern nations was often caught by the crusaders when they returned home they mingled in their own the customs of each country the saracens being of another religion brave desperate and fighting for their fatherland were enlarged to their fears under the tremendous form of paynim giants while the reader of that day followed with trembling sympathy the red cross knight 
thus fiction embellished religion and religion invigorated fiction and such incidents have enlivened the cantos of ariosto and adorned the epic of tasso spenser is the child of their creation and it is certain that we are indebted to them for some of the bold and strong touches of milton our great poet marks his affection for these lofty fables and romances among which his young feet wandered collins was bewildered among their magical seductions and dr johnson was enthusiastically delighted by the old spanish folio romance of felix mart of hircania and similar works the most ancient romances were originally composed in verse before they were converted into prose no wonder that the lacerated members of the poet have been cherished by the sympathy of poetical souls don quixote's was a very agreeable insanity the most voluminous of these ancient romances is le roman de Pierceforet. I have seen an edition in six small folio volumes, and its author has been called the French Homer by the writers of his age. In the class of romances of chivalry, we have several translations in the black letter. These books are very rare, and their price is as voluminous. It is extraordinary that these writers were so unconscious of their future fame that not one of their names has travelled down to us there were eager readers in their days but not a solitary bibliographer all these romances now require some indulgence for their prolixity and their platonic amours but they have not been surpassed in the wildness of their inventions the ingenuity of their incidents the simplicity of their style and their curious manners many a homer lies hid among them but a celebrated italian critic suggested to me that many of the fables of homer are only disguised and degraded in the romances of chivalry those who vilify them as only barbarous imitations of classical fancy condemn them as some do gothic architecture as mere corruptions of a purer style such critics form their decision by preconceived notions they are but indifferent philosophers and to us seem to be deficient in imagination as a specimen i select two romantic adventures the title of the extensive romance of pierce foray is the most elegant delicious mellifluous and delightful history of pierce foray king of great britain etc the most ancient edition is that of fifteen twenty eight the writers of these gothic fables lest they should be considered as mere triflers pretended to an allegorical meaning concealed under the texture of their fable from the following adventure we learn the power of beauty in making ten days appear as yesterday alexander the great in search of pers foray parts with his knights in an enchanted wood and each vows they will not remain longer than one night in one place alexander accompanied by a page arrives at sibylla's castle who is a sorceress he is taken by her witcheries and beauty and the page by the lady's maid falls into the same mistake as his master who thinks he is there only one night they enter the castle with deep wounds and issue perfectly recovered i transcribe the latter part as a specimen of the manor when they were once out of the castle the king said truly floridus i know not how it has been with me but certainly sibylla is a very honourable lady and very beautiful and very charming in conversation sire said floridus it is true but one thing surprises me how is it that our wounds have healed in one night i thought at least ten or fifteen days were necessary truly said the king that is astonishing now king alexander met gadifer king of scotland and the valiant knight latours well said the king have ye news of the king of england ten days we have hunted him and cannot find him out how said alexander did we not separate yesterday from each other in god's name said gadifer what means your majesty it is ten days have a care what you say cried the king sire replied gadifer it is so ask latours 
on my honour said le tours the king of scotland speaks truth then said the king some of us are enchanted floridus didst thou not think we separated yesterday truly truly your majesty i thought so but when i saw our wounds healed in one night i had some suspicion that we were enchanted in the old romance of melusina this lovely fairy though to the world unknown as such enamoured of count raymond marries him but first extorts a solemn promise that he will never disturb her on saturdays on those days the inferior parts of her body are metamorphosed to that of a mermaid as a punishment for a former error agitated by the malicious insinuations of a friend his curiosity and his jealousy one day conduct him to the spot she retired to at those times it was a darkened passage in the dungeon of the fortress his hand gropes its way till it feels an iron gate oppose it nor can he discover a single chink but at length perceives by his touch a loose nail he places his sword in its head and screws it out through this cranny he sees melusina in the horrid form she is compelled to assume that tender mistress transformed into a monster bathing in a fount flashing the spray of the water from a scaly tail he repents of his fatal curiosity she reproaches him and their mutual happiness is for ever lost the moral design of the tale evidently warns the lover to revere a woman's secret such are the works which were the favourite amusements of our english court and which doubtless had a due effect in refining the manners of the age in diffusing that splendid military genius and that tender devotion to the fair sex which dazzle us in the reign of edward the third and through that enchanting labyrinth of history constructed by the gallant Froissart in one of the revenue rolls of henry the third there is an entry of silver clasps and studs for his majesty's great book of romances dr moore observes that the enthusiastic admiration of chivalry which edward the third manifested during the whole course of his reign was probably in some measure owing to his having studied the clasped book in his great-grandfather's library the italian romances of the fourteenth century were spread abroad in great numbers they formed the polite literature of the day but if it is not permitted to authors freely to express their ideas and give full play to the imagination these works must never be placed in the study of the rigid moralist they indeed pushed their indelicacy to the verge of grossness and seemed rather to seek than to avoid scenes which a modern would blush to describe they to employ the expression of one of the authors were not ashamed to name what god had created cynthio bandello and others but chiefly boccaccio rendered libertinism agreeable by the fascinating charms of a polished style and a luxuriant imagination this however must not be admitted as an apology for immoral works for poison is not the less poison even when delicious such works were and still continue to be the favourites of a nation stigmatised for being prone to impure amours they are still curious in their editions and are not parsimonious in their price for what they call an uncastrated copy there are many italians not literary men who are in possession of an ample library of these old novelists if we pass over the moral irregularities of these romances we may discover a rich vein of invention which only requires to be released from that rubbish which disfigures it to become of an invaluable price the decamerones the hecatomity and the novellas of these writers translated into english made no inconsiderable figure in the little library of our shakespeare footnote these early novels have been collected and published by mr j p collier under the title of shakespeare's library they form the foundation of some of the great poets best dramas End of footnote chaucer had been a notorious imitator and lover of them his knight's tale is little more than a paraphrase of boccaccio's tessoida 
fontaine has caught all their charms with all their licentiousness from such works these great poets and many of their contemporaries frequently borrowed their plots not uncommonly kindled at their flame the ardour of their genius but bending too submissively to the taste of their age in extracting the ore they have not purified it of the alloy the origin of these tales must be traced to the inventions of the trouvure who doubtless often adopted them from various nations of these tales le grand has printed a curious collection and of the writers mr ellis observes in his preface to ways fabliaux that the authors of the cento nouvelle antiche boccaccio bandello chaucer gower in short the writers of all europe have probably made use of the inventions of the elder fablers they have borrowed their general outlines which they have filled up with colours of their own and have exercised their ingenuity in varying the drapery in combining the groups and in forming them into more regular and animated pictures we now turn to the french romances of the last century called heroic from the circumstance of their authors adopting the name of some hero the manners are the modern antique and the characters are a sort of beings made out of the old epical the arcadian pastoral and the parisian sentimentality and affectation of the days of Watteau. footnote they were ridiculed in a french burlesque romance of the shepherd lysis translated by davis and published sixteen sixty don quixote when dying made up his mind if he recovered to turn shepherd in imitation of some of the romance heroes who thus finished their career this old anti-romance works out this notion by a mad reader of pastorals who assumes the shepherd habit and tends a few wretched sheep at st cloud End of footnote. the astria of durfey greatly contributed to their perfection as this work is founded on several curious circumstances it shall be the subject of the following article for it may be considered as a literary curiosity the astria was followed by the illustrious bassa artameni or the great cyrus clelia etc which though not adapted to the present age once gave celebrity to their authors and the great cyrus in ten volumes passed through five or six editions their style as well as that of the astria is diffuse and languid yet zaida and the princess of cleves are masterpieces of the kind such works formed the first studies of rousseau who with his father would sit up all night till warned by the chirping of the swallows how foolishly they had spent it some incidents in his nouvelle Eloise have been retraced to these sources and they certainly entered greatly into the formation of his character such romances at length were regarded as pernicious to good sense taste and literature it was in this light they were considered by boileau after he had indulged in them in his youth a celebrated jesuit pronounced an oration against these works the rhetorician exaggerates and hurls his thunders on flowers he entreats the magistrates not to suffer foreign romances to be scattered amongst the people but to lay on them heavy penalties as on prohibited goods and represents this prevailing taste as being more pestilential than the plague itself he has drawn a striking picture of a family devoted to romance reading he there describes women occupied day and night with their perusal children just escaped from the lap of their nurse grasping in their little hands the fairy tales and a country squire seated in an old armchair reading to his family the most wonderful passages of the ancient works of chivalry these romances went out of fashion with our square cocked hats they had exhausted the patience of the public and from them sprung novels they attempted to allure attention by this inviting title and reducing their works from ten to two volumes the name of romance including imaginary heroes and extravagant passions disgusted 
and they substituted scenes of domestic life and touched our common feelings by pictures of real nature heroes were not now taken from the throne they were sometimes even sought after amongst the lowest ranks of the people scarron seems to allude sarcastically to this degradation of the heroes of fiction for in hinting at a new comic history he had projected he tells us that he gave it up suddenly because he had heard that his hero had just been hanged at mans novels as they were long manufactured form a library of illiterate authors for illiterate readers but as they are created by genius are precious to the philosopher they paint the character of an individual or the manners of the age more perfectly than any other species of composition it is in novels we observe as it were passing under our eyes the refined frivolity of the french the gloomy and disordered sensibility of the german and the petty intrigue of the modern italian in some venetian novels we have shown the world that we possess writers of the first order in this delightful province of fiction and of truth for every fiction invented naturally must be true after the abundant invective poured on this class of books it is time to settle forever the controversy by asserting that these works of fiction are among the most instructive of every polished nation and must contain all the useful truths of human life if composed with genius they are pictures of the passions useful to our youth to contemplate that acute philosopher adam smith has given an opinion most favourable to novels the poets and romance writers who best paint the refinements and delicacies of love and friendship and of all other private and domestic affections racine and voltaire richardson marivaux and riccoboni are in this case much better instructors than zeno chrysippus or epictetus the history of romances has been recently given by mr dunlop with many pleasing details but this work should be accompanied by the learned l'anglais du fresnoise bibliothèque des romans published under the name of m le c gordon de Purcell, which will be found useful for immediate reference for titles dates and a copious catalogue of romances and novels to the year seventeen thirty four End of section 132section 133 of curiosities of literature volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april 6090 california united states of america Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. The Astria I bring the Astria forward to point out the ingenious manner by which a fine imagination can veil the common incidents of life and turn whatever it touches into gold. Honored Durf was the descendant of an illustrious family. His brother Anne married Diana of Chateaumorand, the wealthy heiress of another great house. After a marriage of no less duration than twenty-two years, this union was broken by the desire of Anne himself, for a cause which the delicacy of Diana had never revealed. Anne then became an ecclesiastic. Some time afterwards, on air, desirous of retaining the great wealth of Diana in the family, addressed this lady and married her. This union, however, did not prove fortunate. Diana, like the goddess of that name, was a huntress, continually surrounded by her dogs. They dined with her at table and slept with her in bed. This insupportable nuisance could not be patiently endured by the elegant Honor, who was also disgusted with the barrenness of the huntress Diana, who was only delivered every year of abortions. He separated from her and retired to Piedmont, where he passed his remaining days in peace, without feeling the thorns of marriage and ambition rankling in his heart. In this retreat he composed his Astria, a pastoral romance, which was the admiration of Europe during half a century. It forms a striking picture of human life, for the incidents are facts beautifully concealed. They relate the amours and gallantries of the court of Henry IV. The personages in the Astria display a rich invention, and the work might be still read were it not for those wire-drawn conversations, or rather disputations. 
which were then introduced into romances. In a modern edition, the Abbey Sochet has curtailed these tiresome dialogues. The work still consists of ten duodecimos. In this romance, Celidy, to cure the unfortunate Celadon, and to deprive the mirror at the same time of every reason for jealousy, tears her face with a pointed diamond, and disfigures it in so cruel a manner that she excites horror in the breast of the mirror. But he so ardently admires this exertion of virtue that he loves her, hideous as she is represented, still more than when she was most beautiful. Heaven to be just to these two lovers restores the beauty of Celidy, which is affected by a sympathetic powder. This romantic incident is thus explained. Once of the French princes, the mir, when he returned from Italy, treated with coldness his amiable princess Celidy. This was the effect of his violent passion which had become jealousy. The coolness subsisted till the prince was imprisoned for state of affairs in the wood of Vincennes. The princess, with the permission of the court, followed him into his confinement. This proof of her love soon brought back the wandering heart and affections of the prince. The smallpox seized her, which is the pointed diamond, and the dreadful disfigurement of her face. She was so fortunate as to escape being marked by this disease, which is meant by the sympathetic powder. This trivial incident is happily turned into the marvelous. That a wife should choose to be imprisoned with her husband is not singular. To escape being marked by the smallpox happens every day. But to romance, as he has done, on such common circumstances, is beautiful and ingenious. Durf, when a boy, is said to have been enamored of Diana. This indeed has been questioned. Durfe, however, was sent to the island of Malta to enter into that order of knighthood, and in his absence Diana was married to Anne. What an affliction for on air, on his return to see her married, and to his brother. His affection did not diminish, but he concealed it in respectful silence. He had some knowledge of his brother's unhappiness, and on this probably founded his hopes. After several years, during which the modest Diana had uttered no complaint, and declared himself, and shortly afterwards, on air, as we have noticed, married Diana. Our author has described the parties under his false appearance of marriage. He assumes the names of Celadon and Sylvander, and gives Diana those of Astrea and Diana. He is Sylvander, and she Astrea, while she is married to Anne. And he Celadon, and she Diana, when the marriage is dissolved. Sylvander is represented always as a lover who sighs secretly. Nor does Diana declare her passion till overcome by the long sufferings of her faithful shepherd. For this reason, Astrea and Diana, as well as Sylvander and Celadon, go together, prompted by the same despair, to the fountain of the truth of love. Sylvander is called an unknown shepherd, who has no other wealth than his flock. Because our author was the youngest of his family, or rather a knight of Malta who possessed nothing but honor, Celadon in despair throws himself into a river. This refers to his voyage to Malta. Under the name of Alexis, he displays the friendship of Astrea for him and all those innocent freedoms which pass between them as relatives. From this circumstance he has contrived a difficulty inimitably delicate. Something of passion is to be discovered in these expressions of friendship. When Alexis assumes the name of Celadon, he calls that love which Astra has mistaken for fraternal affection. This was the trying moment, for though she loved him, she is rigorous in her duty and honor. She says, what will they think of me if I unite myself with him? After permitting, for so many years, those familiarities which a brother may have taken with his sister, with me, who knew that in fact I remained unmarried. How she got over this nice scruple does not appear. It was, however, for a long time a great obstacle to the felicity of our author. There is an incident which shows the purity of this married virgin, who is fearful the liberty she allowed Celadon might be ill-construed. Phyllis tells the druid Adamus that Astrea was seen sleeping by the fountain of the truth of love, and that unicorns which guarded those waters were observed to approach her and lay their heads on her lap. According to the fable, it is one of properties of these animals never to approach any female but a maiden. At this strange difficulty, our druid remains surprised, while Astrea has thus given incontrovertible proof of her purity. The history of Philandria is that of the elder Durf. None but boys disguised as girls and girls as boys appear in the history. In this manner, he concealed, without offending modesty, the defect of his brother. To mark the truth of this history, when Philander is disguised as a woman, while he converses with Astrea of his love, he frequently alludes to his misfortune, though in another sense. Philander, ready to expire, will die with the glorious name of the husband of Astrea. He entreats her to grant him this favor, 
she accords it to him and swears before the gods that she receives him in her heart for her husband the truth is he enjoyed nothing but the name philanderer dies too in combating with the hideous moor which is the personification of his conscience and which at length compelled him to quit so beautiful an object and one so worthy of being eternally beloved the gratitude of sylvander on the point of being sacrificed represents the consent of Honor's parents to dissolve his vow of celibacy and unite him to diana and the druid adamas represents ecclesiastical power the fountain of the truth of love is that of marriage the unicorns are the symbols of that purity which should ever guard it and the flaming eyes of the lions which are also there represent these inconveniences attending marriage but over which a faithful passion easily triumphs in this manner has our author disguised his own private history and blended in his works a number of little amours which passed at the court of henry the great these particulars were confided to petru on visiting the author in his retirement end of section 133《Section 134 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. — Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. Poets Laureate. The present article is a sketch of the history of Poets Laureate, from a memoir of the French Academy, by the Abbe Renel. The custom of crowning poets is as ancient as poetry itself. It has, indeed, frequently varied. It existed, however, as late as the reign of Theodosius, when it was abolished as the remain of paganism. When the barbarians overspread Europe, few appeared to merit this honour, and fewer who could have read their works. It was about the time of Petrarch that poetry resumed its ancient lustre. He was publicly honoured with the laurel crown, it was in this century, the thirteenth, that the establishment of bachelor and doctor was fixed in the universities. Those who were found worthy of the honour obtained the laurel of bachelor, or the laurel of doctor. Laurea baccalaureatus, laurea doctoratus. At their reception they not only assumed this title, but they also had a crown of laurel placed on their heads. To this ceremony the ingenious writer attributes the revival of the custom. The poets were not slow in putting in their claims to what they had most a right, and their patrons sought to encourage them by these honourable distinctions. The following formula is the exact style of those which are yet employed in the universities to confer the degree of bachelor and doctor, and serves to confirm the conjecture of Raynel. Quote, we, Count and Senator, end quote, Count Donguiara, who bestowed the laurel on Petrarch, quote, for us and our college declare francis petrarch great poet and historian and for a special mark of his quality of poet we have placed with our hands on his head a crown of laurel granting to him by the tenor of these presents and by the authority of king robert of the senate and the people of rome in the poetic as well as in the historic art and generally in whatever relates to the said arts as well in this holy city as elsewhere the free and entire power of reading disputing and interpreting all ancient books to make new ones and compose poems which god assisting shall endure from age to age End quote. in italy these honours did not long flourish although tasso dignified the laurel crown by his acceptance of it many got crowned who were unworthy of the distinction the laurel was even bestowed on cuerno whose character is given in the dunciad not with more glee, by hands pontific crowned, With scarlet hats wide-waving circled round, Rome in her capital saw Querno sit, Throned on seven hills, the Antichrist of wit. Canto two. This man was made laureate for the joke's sake. His poetry was inspired by his cups, A kind of poet who came in with the dessert, And he recited twenty thousand verses. He was rather the arch-buffoon than the arch-poet of Leo X, though honoured with the latter title. They invented for him a new kind of laureated honour, and in the intermixture of the foliage raised to Apollo, slyly inserted the vine in the cabbage leaves, which he evidently deserved, from his extreme dexterity in clearing the pontiff's dishes and emptying his goblets. Urban the Eighth had a jester and more elevated idea of the children of fancy. 
it appears that he possessed much poetic sensibility. Of him it is recorded that he wrote a letter to Chiabrera, to facilitate him on the success of his poetry. Letters written by a pope were then an honour only paid to crowned heads. One is pleased also with another testimony of his elegant dispositions. Charmed with a poem which Bracciolini presented to him, he gave him the surname of Delle Ape, of the Bees, which were the arms of this amiable pope. He, however, never crowned these favourite bars with the laurel, which probably he deemed unworthy of them. In Germany the laureate honours flourished under the reign of Maximilian I. He founded in 1504 a poetical college at Vienna, reserving to himself and their region the power of bestowing the laurel. But the institution, notwithstanding this well-concerted scheme, fell into disrepute, owing to a cloud of claimants who were fired with the rage of versifying, and who, though destitute of poetic talents, had the laurel bestowed on them. Thus it became a prostituted honour, and satires were incessantly levelled against the usurpers of the crown of Apollo. It seems notwithstanding always to have had charms in the eyes of the Germans, who did not reflect, as the abbe elegantly expresses himself, that it faded when it passed over so many heads. The Emperor of Germany retains the laureateship in all its splendour. The selected bard is called Il Poeta Cesario. Apostolo Zeno, as celebrated for his erudition as for his poetic powers, was succeeded by that most enchanting poet, Metastasio. The French never had a poet laureate, though they had regal poets, for none were ever solemnly crowned. The Spanish nation, always desirous of titles of honour, seem to have known that of the laureate, but little information concerning it can be gathered from their authors. Respecting our own country, little can be added to the information of Selden. John Kay, who dedicated a history of Rhodes to Edward the Fourth, takes the title of his humble poet laureate. Gower and Chaucer were laureates, so was likewise Skelton to Henry the Eighth. In the Acts of Rhymer, there is a charter of Henry the Seventh with the title of Pro Poeta Laureato, that is, perhaps only a poet laureated at the university in the king's household. Our poets are never solemnly crowned as in other countries. Selden, after all his recondite researches, is satisfied with saying that some trace of this distinction is to be found in our nation. Our kings from time immemorial have placed a miserable dependent in their household appointment, who is sometimes called the king's poet and the king's versificator. It is probable that at length the selected bard assumed the title of poet laureate without receiving the honours of the ceremony, or, at the most, the crown of laurel was a mere obscure custom practised at our universities, and not attended with great public distinction. It was oftener placed on the skull of a pedant than wreathed on the head of a man of genius. Shadwell united the offices both of poet laureate and historiographer, and by a manuscript account of the public revenue it appears that for two years' salary he received six hundred pounds. At his death, Rymer became the historiographer and Tate the laureate. Both offices seem equally useless, but, if united, will not prove so to the poet laureate. End of section 134《Section 135 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1 by Isaac Disraeli. Angelo Politian. Angelo Politian, an Italian, was one of the most polished writers of the fifteenth century. Bayet has placed him amongst his celebrated children, for he was a writer at twelve years of age. The muses indeed cherished him in his cradle, and the graces hung round it their wreaths. When he became professor of the Greek language, such were the charms of his lectures that Chalcondylus, a native of Greece, saw himself abandoned by his pupils, who resorted to the delightful disquisitions of the elegant Politian. 
critics of various nations have acknowledged that his poetical versions have frequently excelled the originals this happy genius was lodged in a most unhappy form nor were his morals untainted it is only in his literary compositions that he appears perfect as a specimen of his epistles here is one which serves as prefatory and dedicatory the letter is replete with literature though void of pedantry a barren subject is embellished by its happy turns perhaps no author has more playfully defended himself from the incertitude of criticism and the fastidiousness of critics my lord you have frequently urged me to collect my letters to revise and to publish them in a volume i have now gathered them that i might not omit any mark of that obedience which i owe to him on whom i rest all my hopes and all my prosperity i have not however collected them all because that would have been a more laborious task than to have gathered the scattered leaves of the sibyl it was never indeed with an intention of forming my letters into one body that i wrote them but merely as occasion prompted and as the subjects presented themselves without seeking for them i never retained copies except of a few which less fortunate i think than the others were thus favoured for the sake of the verses they contained to form however a tolerable volume i have also inserted some written by others but only those with which several ingenious scholars favoured me and which perhaps may put the reader in good humour with my own there is one thing for which some will be inclined to censure me the style of my letters is very unequal and to confess the truth i did not find myself always in the same humour and the same modes of expression were not adapted to every person and every topic they will not fail then to observe when they read such a diversity of letters i mean if they do read them that i have composed not epistles but once more miscellanies i hope my lord notwithstanding this that amongst such a variety of opinions of those who write letters and of those who give precepts how letters should be written i shall find some apology some probably will deny that they are ciceronian i can answer such and not without good authority that in epistolary composition we must not regard cicero as a model another perhaps will say that i imitate cicero and him i will answer by observing that i wish nothing better than to be capable of grasping something of this great man were it but his shadow another will wish that i had borrowed a little from the manner of pliny the orator because his profound sense and accuracy were greatly esteemed i shall oppose him by expressing my contempt of all writers of the age of pliny if it should be observed that i have imitated the manner of pliny i shall then screen myself by what sidonius apollinaris an author who is by no means disreputable says in commendation of his epistolary style do i resemble simachus i shall not be sorry for they distinguish his openness and conciseness am i considered in no wise resembling him i shall confess that i am not pleased with his dry manner will my letters be condemned for their length plato aristotle thucydides and cicero have all written long ones will some of them be criticised for their brevity i allege in my favour the examples of dion brutus apollonius philostratus marcus antoninus alciphron julian symmachus and also lucian who vulgarly but falsely is believed to have been philarus i shall be censured for having treated of topics which are not generally considered as proper for epistolary composition i admit this censure provided while i am condemned seneca also shares in the condemnation another will not allow of a sententious manner in my letters i will still justify myself by seneca another on the contrary desires abrupt sententious periods dionysius shall answer him for me who maintains that pointed sentences should not be admitted into letters is my style too perspicuous 
it is precisely that which philostratus admires is it obscure such as that of cicero to attica negligent an agreeable negligence in letters is more graceful than elaborate ornaments laboured nothing can be more proper since we send epistles to our friends as a kind of presence if they display too nice an arrangement the halicarnassian shall vindicate me if there is none artemon says there should be none now as a good and pure latinity has its peculiar taste its manners and to express myself thus its atticisms if in this sense a letter shall be found not sufficiently attic so much the better for what was herod the sophist censured but that having been born an athenian he affected too much to appear one in his language should a letter seem too attical still better since it was by discovering theophrastus who was no athenian that a good old woman of athens laid hold of a word and shamed him shall one letter be found not sufficiently serious i love to jest or is it too grave i am pleased with gravity is another full of figures letters being the images of discourse figures have the effect of graceful action in conversation are they deficient in figures this is just what characterizes a letter this want of figure does it discover the genius of the writer this frankness is recommended does it conceal it the writer did not think proper to paint himself and it is one requisite in a letter that it should be void of ostentation you express yourself some one will observe in common terms on common topics and in new terms on new topics the style is thus adapted to the subject no no he will answer it is in common terms you express new ideas and in new terms common ideas very well it is because i have not forgotten an ancient greek precept which expressly recommends this it is thus by attempting to be ambidextrous i try to ward off attacks my critics however will criticise me as they please it will be sufficient for me my lord to be assured of having satisfied you by my letters if they are good or by my obedience if they are not so florence fourteen ninety four end of section one hundred and thirty five section one hundred and thirty six of curiosities of literature volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume one by isaac disraeli original letter of queen elizabeth in the cotonian library vespasian f three is preserved a letter written by queen elizabeth then princess her brother edward the sixth had desired to have her picture and in gratifying the wishes of his majesty elizabeth accompanies the present with an elaborate letter it bears no date of the year in which it was written but her place of residence was at hatfield there she had retired to enjoy the silent pleasures of a studious life and to be distant from the dangerous politics of the time when mary died elizabeth was still at hatfield at the time of its composition she was in habitual intercourse with the most excellent writers of antiquity her letter displays this in every part of it but it is too rhetorical it is here now first published letter like has the rich man that daily gathereth riches to riches and to one bag of money layeth a great sort till it come to infinite so methinks your majesty not being sufficed with many benefits and gentleness showed to me afore this time doth now increase them in asking and desiring where you may bid and command requiring a thing not worthy the desiring for itself but made worthy for your highness request my picture i mean in which if the inward good mind towards your grace might as well be declared as the outward face and countenance shall be seen i would nor have tarried the commandment but prevent it nor have been the last to grant but the first to offer it 
for the face i grant i might well blush to offer but the mind i shall never be ashamed to present for though from the grace of the picture the colours may fade by time may give by weather may be spotted by chance yet the other nor time with her swift wings shall overtake nor the misty clouds with their lowerings may darken nor chance with her slippery foot may overthrow of this although yet the proof could not be great because the occasions hath been but small notwithstanding as a dog hath a day so may i perchance have time to declare it in deeds where now i do write them but in words and further i shall most humbly beseech your majesty that when you shall look on my picture you will wit safe to think that as you have but the outward shadow of the body afore you so my inward mind wisheth that the body itself were oftener in your presence howbeit because both my so being i think could do your majesty little pleasure though myself great good and again because i see as yet not the time agreeing thereunto i shall learn to follow this saying of horace ferris non culpes quod vitari non potest and thus i will troubling your majesty i fear end with my most humble thanks beseeching god long to preserve you to his honour to your comfort to the realm's profit and to my joy from hatfield this first day of may your majesty's most humble sister and servant elizabeth End of section 136。section 137 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1 by Isaac Disraeli anne boleyn that minute detail of circumstances frequently found in writers of the history of their own times is more interesting than the elegant and general narratives of later and probably of more philosophical historians it is in the artless recitals of memoir writers that the imagination is struck with a lively impression and fastens on petty circumstances which must be passed over by the classical historian the writings of brantome comines foissart and others are dictated by their natural feelings while the passions of modern writers are temperate with dispassionate philosophy or inflamed by the virulence of faction history instructs but memoirs delight these prefatory observations may serve as an apology for anecdotes which are gathered from obscure corners on which the dignity of the historian must not dwell in Husay's memoirs volume one page four hundred and thirty five a little circumstance is recorded concerning the decapitation of the unfortunate anne boleyn which illustrates an observation of hume our historian notices that her executioner was a frenchman of calais who was supposed to have uncommon skill it is probable that the following incident might have been preserved by tradition in france from the account of the executioner himself anne boleyn being on the scaffold would not consent to have her eyes covered with a bandage saying that she had no fear of death all that the divine who assisted at her execution could obtain from her was that she would shut her eyes but as she was opening them at every moment the executioner could not bear their tender and mild glances fearful of missing his aim he was obliged to invent an expedient to behead the queen he drew off his shoes and approached her silently while he was at her left hand another person advanced at her right who made a great noise in walking so that this circumstance drawing the attention of anne she turned her face from the executioner who was enabled by this artifice to strike the fatal blow without being disarmed by that spirit of affecting resignation which shone in the eyes of the lovely anne boleyn the common executioner whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard falls not the axe upon the humble neck but first begs pardon shakespeare 
End of section 137. Section 138 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. James I. It was usual in the reign of James I, when they compared it with the preceding glorious one, to distinguish him by the title of Queen James, and his illustrious predecessor by that of King Elizabeth. Sir Anthony Weldon informs us, quote, that when James I sent Sir Roger Aston as his messenger to Elizabeth, Sir Roger was always placed in the lobby, the hangings being turned so that he might see the Queen dancing to a little fiddle, which was to no other end than that he should tell his master, by her youthful disposition, how likely he was to come to the crown he so much thirsted after. End quote. And indeed, when at her death this same knight, whose origin was low, and whose language was suitable to that origin, appeared before the English council, he could not conceal his Scottish rapture. For, asked how the king did, he replied, quote, Even my lord is like a poor man wandering about forty years in a wilderness and barren soil, and now arrived at the land of promise. End quote. A curious anecdote respecting the economy of the court in these reigns is noticed in some manuscript memoirs written in James's reign, preserved in a family of distinction. The lady, who wrote these memoirs, tells us that a great change had taken place in cleanliness since the last reign, for, having rose from a chair, she found, on her departure, that she had the honour of carrying upon her some companions who must have been inhabitants of the palace the court of elizabeth was celebrated occasionally for its magnificence and always for its nicety james was singularly effeminate he could not behold a drawn sword without shuddering was much too partial to handsome men and appears to merit the bitter satire of churchill if wanting other proofs we should only read the second volume of royal letters six thousand nine hundred eighty seven in the harleian collections which contains stenney's correspondence with james the gross familiarity of Buckingham's address is couched in such terms as these. He calls his majesty, quote, Dear dad and gossip, end quote, and concludes his letters with, quote, Your humble, slow, and dog, Stenny, end quote. Footnote. Buckingham's style was even stronger and coarser than the text leads one to suppose. Quote, your so ship, end quote, is the beginning of one letter, and, quote, I kiss your dirty hands, end quote, the conclusion of another. The king had encouraged this by his own extraordinary familiarity. Quote, my own sweet and dear child, end quote, quote, sweet hearty, end quote, quote, my sweet stinne and gossip, end quote, are the commencements of the royal epistles to Buckingham, and in one instance, where he proposes a hunting party and invites the ladies of his family, he does it in words of perfect obscenity. End of footnote. He was a most weak, but not quite a vicious man, yet his expertness in the art of dissimulation was very great indeed. He called this kingcraft. Sir Anthony Weldon gives a lively anecdote of this dissimulation in the king's behaviour to the Earl of Somerset at the very moment he had prepared to disgrace him. The Earl accompanied the king to Royston and, to his apprehension, never parted from him with more seeming affection, though the king well knew he should never see him more. Quote, the earl, when he kissed his hand, the king hung about his neck, slabbering his cheeks, saying, For God's sake, when shall I see thee again? On my soul I shall never eat nor sleep until you come again. The earl told him on Monday, this being on the Friday. For God's sake, let me, said the king. Shall I, shall I? Then lolled about his neck. Then for God's sake give thy lady this kiss for me, in the same manner at the stairs head, at the middle of the stairs and at the stair foot. The earl was not in his coach when the king used these very words, in the hearing of four servants, one of whom reported it instantly to the author of this history. I shall never see his face more. End quote. He displayed great imbecility in his amusements, which are characterized by the following one, related by Arthur Wilson. When James became melancholy in consequence of various disappointments in state matters, Buckingham and his mother used several means of diverting him. Amongst the most ludicrous was the present. 
They had a young lady, who brought a pig in the dress of a newborn infant. The countess carried it to the king, wrapped in a rich mantle. One Turpin, on this occasion, was dressed like a bishop in all his pontifical ornaments. He began the rites of baptism with the common prayer book in his hand. A silver ewer with water was held by another. The marquis stood as godfather. When James turned to look at the infant, the pig squeaked, an animal which he greatly abhorred. At this, highly displeased, he exclaimed, Out! Away for shame! What blasphemy is this? End quote. This ridiculous joke did not accord with the feelings of James at that moment. He was not in the vein. Yet we may observe that had not such artful politicians as Buckingham and his mother been strongly persuaded of the success of this puerile fancy, they would not have ventured on such blasphemies. They certainly had witnessed amusements heretofore not less trivial which had gratified his majesty. The account which Sir Antony Weldon gives, in his court of King James, exhibits a curious scene of James's amusements. Quote, After the king supped, he would come forth to see pastimes and fooleries, in which Sir Ed Zouch, Sir George Goring, and Sir John Finnett were the chief and master fools, and surely this fooling got them more than any other wisdom. Zouch's part was to sing body songs and tell body tales, Finnett's to compose these songs. There was a set of fiddlers brought to court on purpose for this fooling, and Goring was master of the game for fooleries, sometimes presenting David Droman and Archie Armstrong, the king's fool, on the back of the other fools, to tilt one at another, till they fell together by the ears. Sometimes they performed antic dances. But Sir John Millicent, who was never known before, was commended for notable fooling, and was indeed the best extemporary fool of them all." End quote. Weldon's Court of James is a scandalous chronicle of the times. His dispositions were, however, generally grave and studious. He seems to have possessed a real love of letters, but attended with that mediocrity of talent which in a private person had never raised him into notice. Quote, While there was a chance, end quote, writes the author of the Catalogue of Noble Authors, quote, that the dyer's son, Vorstius, might be divinity professor at Leyden, instead of being burnt, as his majesty hinted to the Christian prudence of the Dutch that he deserved to be, our ambassadors could not receive instructions, and consequently could not treat on any other business. The king, who did not resent the massacre at Amboina, was on the point of breaking with the states for supporting a man who professed the heresies of Engidius, Ostodorus, etc., points of extreme consequence Great Britain. Sir Dudley Carleton was forced to threaten the Dutch, not only with the hatred of King James, but also with his pen. End quote. This royal pedant is forcibly characterized by the following observation of the same writer. Quote, Among his Majesty's works is a small collection of poetry. Like several of his subjects, our royal author has condescended to apologize for its imperfections, as having been written in his youth, and his maturer age being otherwise occupied, so that, to employ his own language, when his engine and age could, his affairs and fashery would not permit him to correct them, scarcely but at stolen moments, he having the leisure to blank upon any paper. When James sent a present of his harangues, turned into Latin, to the Protestant princes in Europe, it is not unentertaining to observe in their answers of compliments and thanks how each endeavoured to insinuate that he had read them, without positively asserting it. Buchanan, when asked how he came to make a pedant of his royal pupil, answered that it was the best he could make of him. Sir George Mackenzie relates a story of his tutelage, which shows Buchanan's humour, and the veneration of others for royalty. The young king being one day at play with his fellow pupil, the master of Erskine, Buchanan was reading and desired them to make less noise. As they disregarded his admonition, he told his majesty, if he did not hold his tongue, he would certainly whip his breech. The king replied, he would be glad to see who would bell the cat, alluding to the fable. Buchanan lost his temper, and throwing his book from him, gave his majesty a sound flogging. The old countess of Mar rushed into the room, and taking the king in her arms, asked how he dared to lay his hands on the lord's anointed. Madam, replied the elegant and immortal historian, I have whipped his ass. You may kiss it if you please. End quote. Many years after this was published, I discovered a curious anecdote. Even so late as when James I was seated on the throne of England, once the appearance of his frowning tutor in a dream greatly agitated the king, who in vain attempted to pacify his illustrious pedagogue in this portentous vision. Such was the terror which the remembrance of this inexorable republican tutor had left on the imagination of his royal pupil. James I was certainly a zealous votary of literature. 
His wish was sincere, when viewing the Bodleian Library at Oxford, he exclaimed, quote, Were I not a king, I would be an university man, and if it were so that I must be a prisoner, if I might have my wish, I would have no other prison than this library, and be chained together with these good authors, end quote. Hume has informed us that, quote, his death was decent, end quote. The following are the minute particulars. I have drawn them from an imperfect manuscript collection, made by the celebrated Sir Thomas Brown. Quote, the Lord Keeper, on March 22nd, received a letter from the court, that it was feared His Majesty's sickness was dangerous to death, which fear was more confirmed, for he, meeting Dr. Harvey in the road, was told by him that the King used to have a beneficial evacuation of nature, a sweating in his left arm, as helpful to him as any fontanelle could be, which of late failed. When the Lord Keeper presented himself before him, he moved to cheerful discourse, but it would not do. He stayed by his bedside until midnight. Upon the consultations of the physicians in the morning he was out of comfort, and by the prince's leave told him, kneeling by his pallet, that his days to come would be but few in this world. "'I am satisfied,' said the king. "'But pray you assist me to make me ready for the next world, to go away hence for Christ, whose mercies I call for, and hope to find.' From that time the keeper never left him, or put off his clothes to go to bed. The king took the communion, and professed he died in the bosom of the Church of England, whose doctrine he had defended with his pen, being persuaded it was according to the mind of Christ, as he should shortly answer it before him. He stayed in the chamber to take notice of everything the king said, and to repulse those who crept much about the chamber door, and into the chamber. They were, for the most, addicted to the Church of Rome. Being rid of them, he continued in prayer, while the king lingered on, and at last shut his eyes with his own hands." End quote. Thus, in the full power of his faculties, a timorous prince encountered the horrors of dissolution. Religion rendered cheerful the abrupt night of futurity. And what can philosophy do more, or rather, can philosophy do as much? I propose to have examined with some care the works of James I, but that uninviting task has been now postponed till it is too late. As a writer, his works may not be valuable, and are infected with the pedantry and the superstition of the age. Yet I suspect that James was not that degraded and feeble character in which he ranks by the contagious voice of criticism. He has had more critics than readers. After a great number of acute observations and witty allusions, made extempore, which we find continually recorded of him by contemporary writers, and some not friendly to him, I conclude that he possessed a great promptness of wit, and much solid judgment and acute ingenuity. It requires only a little labour to prove this. That labour I have since zealously performed. This article, composed more than thirty years ago, displays the effects of first impressions in popular clamours. About ten years I suspected that his character was grossly injured, and lately I found how it has suffered from a variety of causes. That monarch preserved for us a peace of more than twenty years, and his talents were of a higher order than the calumnies of the party who have remorselessly degraded him have allowed a common inquirer to discover. For the rest, I must refer the reader to an inquiry into the literary and political character of James I, in which he may find many correctives for this article. I shall in a future work enter into further explanations of this ambiguous royal author. End of section 138、section 139、of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. General Monk and His Wife. From the manuscript collection of Sir Thomas Brown, I shall rescue an antidote which has a tendency to show that it was not advisable to permit ladies to remain at home when political plots are to be secretly discussed. And while it displays the treachery of Monk's wife, it will also appear that, like other great revolutionists, it was ambition that first induced him to become the reformer he pretended to be. Monk gave fair promises to the rump, but last agreed with the French ambassador to take the government on himself, by whom he had a promise from Mazarin of assistance from France. 
This bargain was struck late at night, but not so secretly that Monk's wife, who had posted herself conveniently behind the hangings, finding what was resolved upon, sent her brother Clarget away immediately with notice of it to Sir A. A. She had promised to watch her husband and to inform Sir A. how matters went. Sir A. caused the Council of State whereof he was a member to be summoned and charged Monk that he was playing false. The general insisted that he was true to his principles and firm to what he had promised and that he was ready to give them all satisfaction. Sir A. told him if he were sincere he might remove all scruples and should instantly take away their commissions from such and such men in his army and appoint others, and that before he left the room. Monk consented. A great part of the commissions of his officers were changed, and Sir Edward Harley, a member of the council, and then present, was made governor of Dunkirk, in the room of Sir William Lockhart. The army ceased to be at Monk's devotion. The ambassador was recalled and broke his heart. Such were the effects of the infidelity of the wife of General Monk. End of section 139。section 140 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli. Philip and Mary. Husay, in his memoirs, Volume 1, page 261, has given the following curious particulars of this singular union. The second wife of Philip was Mary, Queen of England, a virtuous princess, Husay was a good Catholic, but who had neither youth nor beauty. This marriage was as little happy for the one as for the other. The husband did not like his wife, although she doted on him, and the English hated Philip still more than he hated them. Silhon says that the rigor which he exercised in England against heretics particularly hindered Prince Carlos from succeeding to that crown, and for which purpose Mary had invited him in case she died childless. But no historian speaks of this pretended inclination, and it is probable that Mary ever thought proper to call the succession of the English throne the son of the Spanish monarch? This marriage had made her nation detest her, and in the last years of her life she could be little satisfied with him from his marked indifference for her. She well knew that the Parliament would never consent to exclude her sister Elizabeth whom the nobility loved for being more friendly to the new religion and more hostile to the house of Austria. In the Cottonian Library, Vespasian F. Three is preserved a note of instructions in the handwriting of Queen Mary, of which the following is a copy. It was, probably, written when Philip was just seated on the English throne. Instructions for my Lord Privisel first to tell the king the whole state of this realm with all things appertaining to the same as much as ye know to be true second to obey his commandment in all things thirdly in all things he shall ask your advice to declare your opinion as becometh a faithful counsellor to do mary the queen Husay proceeds after the death of mary philip sought Elizabeth in marriage, and she, who was yet unfixed at the beginning of her reign, amused him at first with hopes, but as soon as she unmasked herself to the Pope, she laughed at Philip, telling the Duke of Feria, his ambassador, that her conscience would not permit her to marry the husband of her sister. This monarch, however, had no such scruples. Incest appears to have had in his eyes peculiar charms, for he offered himself three times to three different sisters-in-law. He seems also to have known the secret of getting quit of his wives when they became inconvenient. In state matters he spared no one whom he feared. To them he sacrificed his only son, his brother, 
and a great number of princes and ministers. It is said of Philip that before he died he advised his son to make peace with England and war with the other powers. Pesum cum Anglo, bellum cum relinquis. Queen Elizabeth and the ruin of his invincible fleet physicked his frenzy into health and taught him to fear and respect that country which he thought he could have made a province of Spain. On his deathbed he did everything he could for salvation. The following protestation, a curious morsel of bigotry, he sent to his confessor a few days before he died. Father Confessor, as you occupy the place of God, I protest to you that I will do everything you shall say to be necessary for my being saved, so that what I omit doing will be placed to your account as I am ready to acquit myself of all that should be ordered to me. Is there in the records of history a more glaring instance of the idea which a good Catholic attaches to the power of a confessor than the present authentic example? The most licentious philosophy seems not more dangerous than a religion whose votary believes that the accumulation of crimes can be dissipated by the breath of a few orisons, and which, considering a venal priest to occupy the place of God, can traffic with the divine power at a very moderate price. After his death, a Spanish grandee wrote with a coal on the chimney-piece of his chamber the following epitaph, which ingeniously paints his character in four verses. Siendo mozo luxurioso, siendo hombre fue cruel, siendo viejo codicioso, ¿qué se puede esperar de él? In youth he was luxurious, in manhood he was cruel, in old age he was avaricious. What could be hoped from him? End of section 140 End of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 1, by Isaac Disraeli.